This looks like a move by an outfit called Robin Hood, which is supposed to be taking momentum rather than no, a deep I, fundamental okay, do analysis. not use the word rigged. Why? Because it's too inflammatory. Dangerously close to the collapse of the entire system. We like the stock. We like the stock. I gotta just dip. Let me just dip. We want to stop. But they're very smart about what they're talking how did it come to this? That's right. How did it come to this? How do we make sense of all of this? And why are all the arrows now pointing to crypto? Well, before that, I should probably clarify what this actually is. Rewind to January 28th, 2021. GameStop stock is now trading above $300 a nearly 1,500% increase from the beginning of the year. Hedge fund short positions are being squeezed by a community of retail traders known as r slash Wall Street Bets, who are buying as much GME stock as they can afford through the free brokerage app Robinhood. Then, during the morning pre-market hours, an unprecedented waterfall of decisions occurs. Robinhood, followed shortly thereafter by many other retail brokerages, blocks the ability to buy GME and other meme stocks. Retail traders can now only close positions rather than open them. This creates a lopsided market that drives GME stock prices down below $200 at market close. The public outcry against these decisions was swift and strong. Robinhood was quickly accused of nefarious motives because of their ties to Citadel, a hedge fund who indirectly had a large short position in GameStop. The brokerages defended themselves by citing financial regulatory requirements and by warning of an imminent collapse of the entire market. But what really happened? And why did the tension from this event spill over into crypto? To make sense of these events, we turn to Sam Bankman fried CEO of FTX and Alameda Research, and Cointelegraph's third most important person in blockchain in 2021. Before Sam moved into crypto, he was a trader for three years at Jane Street Capital, which is one of the largest market makers in the world. In 2020 alone, they traded more than $17 trillion worth of securities. So this has given you a very intimate knowledge of how the American financial system works, how the stock market works. Um, so, you know, given that background and given all that we've experienced over the past few weeks, how do you assess this anomaly that was the GameStop event? Clearly, something really bad happened that day on Robinhood, and it, it, it was, is, is, is bad. I mean, it's is bad, and clearly Robinhood is, is at least partially at fault for that. Um, and, and you sort of know that just because like, it went really poorly, and that's their whole fucking business, is having, like, that should have been their best day ever, you know? That should have been the day that Robinhood, like, grew 10x. And instead, it was the day people started writing the obituaries. Um, but I, I think people often misdiagnose exactly what went wrong there and sort of end up with these like somewhat myopic views where, you know, it's sort of like this all encompassing, you know, all encompassing sort of like good versus evil. And all of a sudden they're evil and everything is sort of like, you know, rooted in malice. And, 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 you know, I think this is a case where like things did absolutely go wrong. But, you know, I don't think that they were like colluding with hedge funds to try and protect you know, people's like p and um, on, on, on a short position or anything. I, I think what happened basically was they just like were not prepared for, for that day. It, like many, many parts of their business were not prepared for it. And, you know, the core thing that happened there, the biggest thing that got them in trouble is this thing called regulatory capital. And where this comes from, it's sort of an interesting thing that doesn't make sense in a crypto context, um, is that, um, you know, in traditional finance, it's not like you have, you know, two users deposit their funds irrevocably via a blockchain onto one platform and then trade against each other. There are customers of it, right? Which is sort of what happens in crypto. Instead, you have like 12 companies um, sitting in this process. And it's sort of this long food chain of them, you know, going from, you know, customer trades against Robinhood, um, who then offloads the flow uh, to Citadel, who then uses some technology service to um, connect to uh, New York Stock Exchange using a, a, a you know, JP Morgan or something to, to custody their assets. Um, and then, you know, trades on New York Stock Exchange against some other big broker who then, you know, you have the exact same thing, you know, playing out in, on the opposite side. 
And so it's, it's like 12 companies you know, that are involved in that process. And what that means is that it's all messy. You're gluing a lot of things together and a lot of things can go wrong. And, and, and so because of this, there's this thing called regulatory, sorry, regulatory capital, um, which basically says, look, we understand that like you, Robinhood, think you're not doing a trade here, that like this is just one of your users against another, right? And that you don't have exposure here. And so like, you know, whatever, like one of them will win, one of them will lose, and, and you know, you don't care. Um, but you can't know for sure that everyone is good for what they say. You can't know for sure everyone's going to deliver, that the person who bought game stock is going to be able to deliver the dollars, and the person who sold it is going to be able to deliver the stock. One of them might go bankrupt. They might not actually have the stock. You know, there might have been, and whatever, there's sort of like a number of things that could have gone wrong in that process. And, and so they sort of bake in some baseline level of like shit got fucked up um, in, in all these trades and like failure to deliver and things like this. And, and, and what that results in, in is they basically say, look, because some of these trades might fail, you need to keep Robinhood, despite you not putting a position on yourself, you need to keep some capital um, on your platform. Um, in order to basically backstop uh, your users, you know, on both sides of these trades, and there's this complicated formula, which is a function of the vol the position sizes and the volatility and things like that. Um, and it's like at least you need to keep 10% of the position size of your users as extra capital on the platform, not the capital for that position that the users have to supply, but you have to supply that in addition. And and so anyway, they have to post this rate cap, and you know, basically what happened was like all of a sudden you know, and the world went sort of crazy and, uh, you know, their positions kind of grew massively from what they had ever been before, basically. And they just didn't have enough regulatory capital. They just like did not own enough money in order to legally be allowed to offer all of those trades to their users. Um, and, you know, they sort of woke up one day and they had to pay, uh, not pay, but they had to post as collateral, uh, you know, like $2 billion and they just didn't have $2 billion. And so they couldn't, and so they they stopped users from opening new positions, and 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 in fact started forcibly closing them down. Um, and this is sort of like the backstory here, and it's sort of this, in some sense a boring technical backstory, which is just a lot lot less exciting than this sort of like, you know, good versus evil narrative. Um, but on the other hand, that doesn't mean that that they're blameless here, right? Because like, if you're Robin Hood, this wasn't like the uh, something that you never thought would happen. Like, you know that you're the most popular, you know, most topical retail trading app in the country. You know that retail trading is getting incredibly popular. Um, and, you know, frankly, you should be expecting something like this. You should be expecting that there's going to be surges in volatile stocks with tons of interest on your platform. That's what your platform is. That's who you are. And if you can't handle that, it's going to be a really, really bad experience for your users. Like they should have predicted this and they should have prepared. And rather than having to scramble at the last minute after this happened, try and find $2 billion, they should have had procedures in place beforehand to deal with this. And even when it did happen, you know, I sort of think they, I mean, I don't know, like obviously I wasn't there, but like I sort of think they probably weren't trying quite as hard as they should have been to uh, be able to get the capital. You know, this is one of these things where if I were in their place, I would have like, I would have been willing to basically pay anything as a company to be able to get the capital that I needed on, you know, on six hours notice to be able to post so that my customers could keep their positions because like, that's what they deserve. And, and that's, what's going to save the business. And, you know, they, they didn't do that. And, you know, they're sort of paying the price for that. And I think it makes sense that they are because, you know, exactly when their users needed them the most, they were there the least. Um, and, and they showed a number of other ways. I and mean, they turned off trading on a lot of cryptocurrencies later that day. That's not regulatory capital, I don't think. I think that's something else. Like, I think they just like couldn't deal with it. Like couldn't handle the liquidity or volatility or pricing or something like that. Like, they're just like not ready for Dogecoin. Um, and, and you know, overall, it's just sort of like a pretty amateurish performance uh, for what should have been like, again, should have been their best day ever. Yeah. And there were just a multiple, a multitude of strange things that happened that day. Because now it wasn't only Robinhood that block, locked out trading. It was also a number of other oh, yeah. brokerages. And the strangest part was that they just locked the, the demand side. They just locked out demand. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, exactly. It's, it's totally bizarre. And like, usually you wouldn't do that. Usually maybe you'd halt trading in both directions, but of course their problem was they're over rate cap and all of their customers had on the same weight position. So they're trying to decrease that position size, but still it's like very, very bizarre to only lock out buy side. I've never seen that before. It has weird, like inefficient impacts on markets. Like it's not a good thing to do. It's not a healthy thing to do. It doesn't have, it, it has a really bad look and it's, it, it is in fact bad. Um, other weird things were the liquidating users who mm -hmm. seem to have fully funded their accounts. It's not like they had like deposited $10 and then tried to put on a $20 position. They deposited $10 and tried to put on a $10 position. And then they got liquidated on it. And they're sort of like, what the fuck? Like this wasn't a margin trade. Like I understand that sometimes margin trades get liquidated when prices go down, but that's not what this was. This was, this was, this was very much a spot transaction. So why am I getting liquidated? And you know, basic answer was, well, they had to close down positions because they were kind of fucked. And I think they just had some clauses in their like terms of service said, yo, by the way, not that you're going to read this, but technically, unless you say otherwise, everything here is a margin trade, even if it's fully funded. And and, and this is like a, a, a pretty shitty thing to do to your users. No, absolutely. Um, so do you think it was really just them panicking? and not really yeah. knowing what to do more so than any other like of this conspiracy kind of. Yeah, they're massively unprepared. The regulars called up, they didn't know what to do. They were freaking out, they were panicking and they did what they felt like they had to do. And they had, did have to do something, but probably they could have come away better than they did. And you know, also they, 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 they shouldn't have left that one till the last minute. They, they should have been prepared for it, so. Do you see this as like the system working as intended? Yeah, I mean, in some sense, yes. Like. You know, I think there's a way in which it is, but obviously it's, you know, sometimes it's not easy to, to sort of separate out the system from the participants in the system. And clearly Robinhood didn't work as intended. And so, you know, I think in one way you could, you could blame the system. You could also just say, look, the system had these weird rules, but everyone knew they were there. Everyone should have been ready for them. Like it's sort of Robin's Hood fault that, you know, Robin Hood's fault that they weren't. I think that'd be a totally reasonable sort of take here as well. What kind of reaction do you expect to see from the regulatory bodies? I mean, because on paper, no one really did anything wrong. But um, wh how do you think their reaction is going to be to this? Yeah, it's super interesting because you see different people ta having completely different approaches and completely different responses to what the problem was here, right? You see some people saying the problem was the, the coordinated manipulative buying. Some people saying the problem was this uh, short selling. Some people saying the problem was Robin Hood. Some people saying the problem was Red Cap. I mean, it's like, you know, so many things have been blamed for this. And, you know, in the end, it's sort of like, you know, just this case where like, look, I don't know, like it was a complicated situation and things didn't work out well. And, you know, I think it's not obvious exactly who is to blame how much. So certainly Robin Hood deserves a fair bit of that. Um, but, but yeah, you see like totally different responses from, uh, you know, from different people, um, you know, in, in Washington on this. And I don't know how that's going to end up, frankly. I think that like best guess is nowhere. I think best guess is nothing's going to change because it's a weird idiosyncratic case and people can't agree on what the right way to interpret it is anyway, other than everyone thinks that Robin Hood sucks. Yeah. And that's kind of the saddest outcome, isn't it? Because the whole point of this movement that it kind of became was to create some sort of change, to instigate some sort of change, you know, at least uh, bulk at the system, you know? Um, and if nothing ends up happening because of it, it's just going to be like, it feels kind of like the nail in the coffin a little bit. Yeah, I, it does. And I think that it's, you know, not nothing will change. Like one thing that's going to change is sort of weird, but I do think this is like the thing that most clearly will change um, is Robin Hood is, is going to take a big hit from this, right? Like they survived, but I mean, not well, like can't imagine this is good for their valuation. Can't imagine this is good for the user base. Um, you know, this is really bad for their long term business. And, and if nothing else, I think they're going to pay the price for for this. Mm -hmm. Do you see this, um, this event in history as kind of like a turning point? Because a lot of people have called it like a cultural turning point, or something along these lines, a pivotal moment in finance. Do you see it as such? Will we look back at this day, 10 years down the line and say, you know, okay, this is when the population, the retail population gained a financial voice and caused them to do this, 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 and that along the way? I think I would say something a little bit less strong than that. You know, I think what I would say is something like 
this has been brewing for a very long time and a number of pieces of this story are not are not new they're extremely clearly telegraphed you know a year or two in advance i do think this is sort of a watershed moment though i think this is a moment when it, it all came to a head and we sort of all just in there out in the open you know and everyone just sort of was like oh boy this is what's happened um but but i do think that like much of what led to this had been brewing for 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 years and i think that like you you can look at everything from board day traders during covid to the sort of like general elon musk movement um to you know some combination of occupy wall street but also you know i it, it's sort of you know growth and, and 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 sort of like fading away and and what what it was left with was sort of a weird more capitalist take on it um and i uh, and i think that you know that's been growing for a while wall street bets has been growing for a while um and you know i think that a lot of people sort of want to phrase this as like frustration with the elites you know and sort of an anti-elite movement and i think that's not quite right um because i mean you know one thing obviously you can look at like you know i mean elon musk is is the richest person in the world and is sort of the spokesperson for it so it's clearly not like an anti-rich person thing exactly. Well, it's like anti-establishment, isn't it? It's more anti-establishment, yeah. It's more anti-establishment. Um, it has a, sort of a lot of, of sort of, um, you know, I, this is like newer generation type stuff, you know? A lot of, um, you know, it's, it's got a lot of like, uh, I, I don't know how to put it exactly, but sort of rebelliousness. You know, it has a lot of like, uh, you know, sticking a middle finger to the system, even even if it's sort of like some people who are very doing quite well in that system, who are who are, you know, leading it. Um, and and yeah, I think that this is like, you know, something more less economic. It, it's not sort of economically um, anti elitist. It's more culturally so. I think it's more like you know, these sort of institutions that have been controlling the way that we talk and think about things, um, you know, and I think it has a playful aspect too, right? Like, I think it's hard to talk about it without talking about memes, without talking about trolling, right? Without talking about Elon's shit posts. These, like, that, that is really the heart and soul of it. And it's sort of interesting because they're, intentionally not really serious but kind of but not really you know and and i think that that's part of the movement too you know part of this is a like oh you guys take yourself so seriously you know not only do i like think that's sort of like elitist but 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 something stronger which is that it it's not necessary that it doesn't even accomplish what you think it is that you know this sort of like decoupling of elitism with wealth and this decoupling of elitism with success and trying to make the point of you can be fantastically successful and wealthy in the system without being culturally the same way as sort of the you know quote unquote stodgy old folk are you know without playing the the game in terms of how you think and talk and what you endorse you know you can shit post on Twitter and still be a hundred billionaire and um and you know you can sort of like thumb your nose at the SEC and and still see your stock price do well. And and I think that, that that sort of, you know, that is really an integral piece of this. It's, a, it's, it's you bring up a number of really interesting points in there actually. Um, I like the memes thing because it's kind of like homebrew advertising <laughs> in a way for, yeah. for things, right? You know, because people like it and then that makes them kind of want to buy it. But it's also this kind of cultural thing that just perpetuates itself because, you know, it's fun. Um, so it's a really interesting dynamic that's brought about by social media. And then the other thing about separating elitism from wealth is, is, is also interesting because you have figures like Elon Musk, uh, Mark Cuban, David Portnoy, you know, not really traditional kind of big finance, hedge fund, old white guy kind of figures who are supporting this uh, grassroots Wall Street bets movement, um, yeah. which, you know, do you find that a little ironic or does it totally yeah, fit? Well, I think it's ironic under the understanding that I think many people had of 
elitism and how many people thought of it, um, I think it makes sense from the perspective that, you know, that, that sort of this new movement is thinking about it. Uh, but it is a different way of thinking. And it's a, I, you know, it's something which I think isn't necessarily quite what people want to pose it as. You know, it's very easy to pose this as sort of like socialism 2.0, um, and it's very much not that. It's very much pro-wealth, you know, and pro-capitalism. Trying to pose this as, um, you know, sort of, I, uh, you know, sort of stoners like, ah, oh, whatever, chill out. Like, why you got to be so uptight? But in fact, it's very into working hard, and 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 trying to achieve what you can, and 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 so I, I think it's like, you know, very, a uh, paradoxical isn't quite the right word, but I think paradoxical if you came at it from two dogmatic and historical lens. Let's let's uh, kind of circle back to the, the GameStop saga, um, because after the people got locked out of the trading on through on the, all these various platforms like Robinhood, Webull, E-Trade, TD Ameritrade and all that, there is a huge rush into Doge of all things. And it just pumped yeah. Doge up. Why was Doge the outlet? for the the casino frenzied uh traders oh it was definitely going to be the outlet there's no question about that and i mean just think about you know think about where this is coming from right like partially it's that elon musk who's who is by far the most influential person for this movement and, and maybe in the world almost right now um i what cryptocurrency was he most associated with the answer is dogecoin um, and so that alone was going to be, a, you know, powerful, uh, you know, sort of incentive for, for, for Dogecoin becoming the cryptocurrency of choice. And But beyond that, it sort of stands for some things that this movement does in a weird sort of way, the not taking yourself too seriously, the emphasis of memes, um, you know, the sort of like, you know, maybe you'll, you'll a thousand X your money uh, type thing. And, you know, Dogecoin is a very low price coin. Um, and... Um, and yeah, I just think like in a lot of ways, it was just a the obvious coin that it was always going to be. Um, and, you know, basically it was just sort of like how many stocks is this going to go through before it ends up with Dogecoin? Because it, this was like the, the, the most crypto like I've ever seen finance by far. And, and it was clearly going to end in crypto or at least traverse through crypto one way or another, given exactly how... Um, you know, how similar these markets were to crypto markets. Um, and, you know, to kind of add more, uh, you know, more sort of fuel on the fire, um, I, you know, halfway through this sort of like exhausting, exciting, amazing uh, day, um, what happened was a bunch of centralized platforms shut off trading for their users. And like, there's sort of never been a better advertisement for people uh, day trading cryptocurrency than that. There, there are a couple things because you know, even in crypto, you still have to access the crypto through centralized platforms. And yeah. so, I, I wanted to come back to something that we touched upon, like way at the beginning of all this, which was um, kind of the systematic differences between the financial system and the crypto system. You were saying that people in yeah. the crypto system don't really understand the, the traditional financial system because of the supply chain of the 12 different companies your stock has to go through before you actually get it um, and that sort of thing. So I'd like to take a look a bit closer at this uh, systematic difference between the two. Um, is crypto better prepared to handle a similar situation to the one that happened with GameStop and Robinhood? No, I mean, sorry, it's it's well prepared to handle that very specific issue, uh, because you know that very specific issue doesn't currently apply to most cryptocurrency platforms. Um, but that that's sort of like a really local answer. And if you branch out even a little bit in your question. Right, and you were like, "All right, well, how did crypto platforms do that day when Robinhood shut down some of its trading?" The answer is they're all down. <laughs> Coinbase was down, Binance was down, Kraken was down. Um, I they they got overloaded, couldn't couldn't handle it, and and it sort of like you know turned off trading for a while, and um, you know that was not well received either, um, and 
you know, why was I? Well, they they also weren't prepared. You know, like they they were not prepared for that increase in volume and volatility, and so their matching engines fell over. And it was a more technical problem and, and a less financial problem than what Robinhood ran into. But you know, it sort of shares this common theme of like, you know, not actually being a robust enough product to be able to survive. Uh, you know, more uh, to, to be able to survive, you know, difficult circumstances. Um, so, so, yeah, I think that that's sort of like, you know, my high level answer is that, um, well, it was, you know, actually sort of a shit show on all fronts. Um, and I don't think, it, you know, I think most platforms did not come out that day looking, looking so good. So uh, that being said, on the specific point of like, you know, decentralization, they did. Like that specific point um, um, of, of decentralization and relying on fewer intermediaries and things like that, um, I, you know, the crypto exchanges came out way better. Mm -hmm. So like looking down the road a bit and examining the, the viability of both systems in these kind of like massive volume volatility situations, would you say that, you know, once the infrastructure is built a bit more, is the crypto sphere better able to handle this kind of big this big volume i think it theoretically should be but it's i want to hesitate a little bit in saying that because i mean you know you, you can also look at what happened on march 12th right where um there is you know again huge volatility really messy day and you know crypto exchanges i mean fell over there because of liquidity and it was a complete you know it did not go well and so, I uh, you know I don't think they have a great track record here exactly. So you know I think like, yeah I don't know maybe maybe, maybe. I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't express extreme confidence there. Because it was kind of interesting to see you know when the whole Robinhood thing happened and then all the the Bitcoin shills were like this is why we need decentralized currency and all that. And I was just thinking like, hmm, you know, I don't, does it, does it really solve like the main liquidity <laughs> issue here? <laughs> There's a lot of pieces to this, you know, and you know, I, I think some of the story here is, is like, it's hard to build something complicated and good. That's not an easy task, you know, it's not an easy problem. And lots of people have tried and failed and some people have tried and failed less. And, and that's what you're aiming for. That's an interesting take on it. Um, and to wrap things up, I'd like to leave us off with um, your response to something that Elon Musk said recently about Dogecoin. And he said that um, by far the most ironic outcome of this entire situation would be for Dogecoin to end up becoming the global uh, currency, you know? And his yeah. reasoning was because fate loves irony. Fate loves irony. Like the most entertaining outcome is the most, like what would be the most ironic outcome? That the, the, the currency that was invented as a joke, in fact, becomes the real currency. So well, what's, your, what's your take on that? I don't think fate loves irony, but I think people in the world love amusing stories. And sometimes that looks pretty similar. All right. Well, I hope that one day I'll be able to throw you some doge <laughs> and that'll be the U.S. dollar of the, of the planet. That would be something. What a world. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Sam. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me.